All right, guys, Touch Cry back again today. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. Welcome back to the new year and welcome back to the Breaking Point podcast. It has been quite some time. Things got pretty hectic over the holiday period, but also things were just so depressing in the COD scene that it was tough to make a good episode. But, uh, well, things are hopefully a little bit more back in business now. There's at least been some positive stuff happening as of late. So, well, we're going to dive into it all today because the COD community had a massive meltdown over the last couple of weeks, uh, really at the turn of the new year. And you can kind of understand it so we're going to dive into a fair few things i'm joined by the usual suspect as per usual next week i believe we'll be back on twitch live streaming it for you guys this week we can't do that but it's all good and um, also thanks very much to those of you who uh, the spotify wrapped thing came out a little bit ago and there was a lot of you guys reaching out saying that uh, we were the number one podcast of your guys year or at least on the top five so really appreciate that one come on the boys um yeah like on the video appreciate all the good stuff lion how are you doing and um, a bit of a disaster with the headset today, but you know, we, we keep going. Uh, yeah, for the fourth time this year, I managed to break my headphones. So, um, fourth time in five days. No, good <laughs> shout. It's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, no, I'm running the speakers right now, so it's a pretty scuffed setup. But I've been good, just been working, designing, same air. What about you, Austin? Uh, doing good, doing a lot better now. Uh, Went, been, been, been in the shitty ending to 2021, but you know it's getting better now, and you know finally getting ready for uh, for the season. How things go sometimes. Life is not easy, but uh, well, let's just dive in. Firstly, COD meltdown thing that happened. I know, like, look, it gets frustrating talking about this. I, I was getting annoyed about it, and I was like, you know just depressing podcast topic to discuss all the negative things that have happened in the cold scene in the last um you know a couple of months or so but i'm just interested to hear your guys opinion on this whole discussion really because it, it felt to me that it was brewing for quite some time that it's um i think people expected really because of course the pandemic happened and things kind of went took a step backwards and then we went into last year where things got substantially better towards the end like i thought there was a real lot of optimism around stage four stage five especially stage five major when the fans were back and the storylines were great and then champs as well was a surprise that like there wasn't more issues with covid and stuff and we had a great event and obviously phase one it there was a lot of optimism around that time but of course the game comes out it's not where we'd like it to be for competitive or for public matches by any means um the support is not where it needs to be either and it just seems like things have, have not taken any advances and the things that have been confirmed if anything have been a step backwards so just i think all these frustrations kind of um culminated the main one i really think being the fact that the season starts so late that's the real frustrating part to me there's two things that annoy me the most firstly the game is terrible if the game was better i think a lot of the problems would be fixed um or at least it wouldn't be as bad as it is and also just the fact that we have to wait so long gives more time for this stuff to get frustrating especially with what halo is doing so that's another discussion but like hex was talking about the fact that he doesn't even go to these meetings anymore he just sends someone to go and take notes because they never listen to what he has to say anyway um he hasn't been to one for like six months so he reckons and uh nature said a similar thing he also did a kind of crazy damning tweet that basically said look i came to my board of directors or investor group at 100 thieves and said look give me the money to make la thieves happen it's i'm gonna make it a success um and then says look you know i guess I was a fool for doing that right with the the lack of support that Activision are giving um almost kind of suggesting like look I wish I hadn't invested in the CDL which is kind of a crazy thing for an owner to say um so yeah I guess I guess uh that, that's some nice positive thoughts there I don't know if you have any perspective on this line really because obviously people haven't been too happy about it there's some small optimism that things might change in the future if people you know if they're listening to what halo's doing but a lot of suggestions are being made there the people at the cdl want to do the best they can but uh it's kind of the higher ups at activision that don't give the resources necessary to make the changes that we'd like to see i, don't, I can't really speak about like the higher ups because i don't really know what's going on i don't think really anyone knows but i think the hardest part has been the fact that Halo has done things really well this year has put a spotlight on how poorly COD has handled the league, especially in the last three years. Because if we look back at 2018, CWL Vegas was only, what, a month after the game came out? December 7th, year, I died. Yeah, like a month and a little bit. And um, it's just been really hard this year, especially because when you look at the investment that these uh, groups put into the league, especially like Nature, I feel really bad for him because... Previously, with 100 Thieves, they were looking so good going into that year in Black Ops 4. 
And I can assume that he was expecting the same sort of success this last year and this year. But it's just the league hasn't been, or not the league, but Activision itself has not been giving them the backing they deserve for the investment they've put in. And that's just, I think, the hardest part about um, all these teams like Nadeshot and like Hex and how things have gone wrong. But yeah, anyway, I don't really want to dwell on this because it just makes me sad. Yeah, I, I think what a lot of fans and I mean, even owners are like, they just expect more um, than, than what people are getting. And they also expect some sort of like transparency with stuff, which, you know, when's the last time the Cloud League Twitter has said anything or basically like put, put out anything to like reassure fans, you know, like what's going on with game modes, maps, you know, walls, doors, like there's no real. Any like whenever there's an issue like in Halo right now, they have so, they have somebody that talks to the public. They have somebody that that says the news, that says everything to the players and stuff. Um, you know, that, I feel like that's what a lot of teams and players and fans are jealous of that we really don't get that. And I think that would be one of the easiest things to take away a lot of the anger that people have is just adding transparency, explaining that you know. A lot of the things are out of the COD League's hands. Like they, they can't. There's some things they can do and some things they can't do. But you know, fans just don't understand that because there's no transparency. So, you know, ho hopefully that is something where um, that we, that we do get like in the in the future. One question I had is about. There's been some talk about the fact that COD Mobile, right, launched with a ranked play and it's actually pretty good compared to what the CDL has to offer, or at least the regular multiplayer games the last few years have had to offer. This year, things might be different, but of course, like even if ranked play is good this year, it's going to arrive later than we would have hoped it would. Um, but, you know, regardless of that, some people have been saying, look, Call of Duty Mobile, just there was a game, I think it was just available in China or something called COD Online, um, basically like a best of Call of Duty, right? It's effectively what COD Mobile is. It's they take all the best guns, all the best maps, more the games, put them into a mobile game and make an extortion about money off microtransactions. And actually, the competitive scene on that game is, is doing rather well. Um, and some of the footage I've seen from the LAN events for, for that game is actually better than what we get in the CDL, which is kind of crazy. But um, still... I've kind of been of the belief the last few years, at least the last couple of years, that it's good for Call of Duty to have the yearly releases because it's necessary, not necessarily necessary, but as you see what happens to Halo, the fact that they have a game and after a few years on the game, the, the, the support kind of dies out because people go elsewhere. Now, I've kind of always thought that, okay, Call of Duty needs a yearly game or at least there's pros and cons. The game isn't very well competitively tuned at the start of the title, but at least there is a new game every year. People are interested in it. It. there's always that kind of excitement for the new call of duty um can kind of jump on the bandwagon to some degree if we had events a little bit earlier of the launch of the game but just given the state of vanguard i've kind of thought look does it just make more sense should their focus and i'm not saying activision's focus will turn to this but i'm sure the sales of vanguard are way down on previous years um you know, is the play in the long term, and maybe this could be shorter term than we think, making like a Call of Duty mobile for PC effectively, or like freaking, you know, console and PC, just like one COD game that goes alongside Warzone that is updated with new maps, new modes, new weapons. Because um, I think that's something they'll probably have to do eventually. Um, I know they're making obviously an insane amount of money for the yearly sales, but if the yearly sales are down year on year because most people are just playing Warzone and they don't need to buy the new game, then maybe it's sooner than we might expect to just have like one title, which could actually be, you know, you would think if they make a COD mobile for PC, that actually will be a good competitive game, you would think. Because, I mean, it's basically Black Ops 2. So, I don't know. It just feels to me that, that they might think about going in that direction soon, that they've already done it, or Tencent have already done it for them with mobile. Don't um, think, like. they, yeah, my opinion on this was uh, I saw Enigma, the guy, he's mm -hmm. esports producer at Deserto. He, um, he tweeted about instead of getting rid of the yearly cycle, they just release a yearly Warzone update and a new multiplayer game. But there's also just like a dedicated competitive title that gets updated with new guns, new maps, but pulls in all the best parts of all the other games but there's just like a dedicated competitive title that is used for the CDL. But then every single year, they still have a new game for like the casual fan base, but it just gets updated, the competitive version, but not a new one. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, I get what you yeah, mean, for sure. 
I feel like that would be the best route to take to like allow the CDL to flourish, but also still get the yearly sales until they get to a point where they don't release yearly. But that's just my opinion. What do you reckon, Austin? Like personally, I, I think what they should do is keep the engine the same from each game to game. So basically like each year you're just dropping a DLC that you have to pay whatever for. So you get a DLC that comes with new multiplayer maps, new guns, new like equipment, new campaign missions, new co-op maps, you know, stuff like that. Like, I think the root of a lot of the issues right now is that each like game is so different from the next that you can't really take anything from game to game. And that's why you see like great things that have been made in COD be left out from year to year. So if they were able to keep the same engine uh, and then just have different DLCs jo- dro- like get dropped, um, new like huge dlc and then for the rest of the year they're just kind of patching fixing keeping everything up to date because then you wouldn't have these issues you know continuously happening year to year um but I, that's just my two cents on stuff but i know I, that would probably drive down sales if it's too similar from year to year to year yeah but then they could also do like remember in black ops 4 when they had what was it it was in blackout it was like the they added the movement from black ops 3 just as like a little gimmick like if they could do that and like bring in little new gimmicks with movement, but just for like separate game modes and have like maybe you can fly or like use the jetpacks in uplink. So uplink can be used as a mode, but then in yeah. hardpoint it's boots <laughs> on the ground and they have all these different aspects from different games and they bring them all together in one competitive title. I think that would be like so good for the COD scene. But alas. <laughs> yeah, alas. Yeah, I, th- I think it's an interesting one because I kind of agree with what you said about and what Enigma said as well. Okay, you have a competitive title, bring out a game you only have for the casual players. But like, I would just, the ideal world is that everyone's playing the same game. That's kind of the, the frustrating thing. Like, I don't want to not have that. There's a reason why this current thing theoretically works well if the games are good, is that people play the game and therefore they get interested in what the pros are doing on the same game. If you have the pros in a separate game, then like... You know what happens there is the search and destroy scene on the new game every year it gets a bit messy right so and it's also impossible not impossible but it's really difficult to bring in new fans for like players who are casual casually interested right like in an ideal world you want to go back to like black ops 3 say when you've got scump and all these other players creating a load of youtube videos because they love playing the game and you've got scump you know putting 70 kill tdm challenges to like 200k views every single day like that's that's obviously great the state of the game right now the state of how public matches have gone and just the way content has gone in general in COD down the Warzone route doesn't really make that feasible now to actually make content in that sense. That's what all the drama was really about in the whole meltdown thing. It was like, okay, what can you even make content on right now? And a lot of the pros are like, well, look, you know, you're saying I should make more content, but I don't want to stream my practice. And what else can I play, right? Maybe there's eights sometimes, pubs are awful, and then I can play Warzone. But that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much all I got on the plate. Um, so it's an interesting one for sure. Just wanted to kind of uh, take a slightly different tack on this is that there was this non mandatory meeting between the players back in kind of mid December time. And Austin may know something about this, but you know, we can touch on it as, as, um, as well as we can really. But uh, there was a non mandatory meeting that the players didn't have to attend, but they could. Then apparently there might have been a mandatory one more recently where the players kind of got told what the format was going to be. But um, there's a bit of drama because Optic were meant to play up against uh, Los Angeles Gorillas in this uh, scrim set. And uh, for whatever reason well pretty much i'm pretty sure rambo and ely went along to it and then the rest of the guys didn't attend and lag ended up being late to the scrim and there was a bit of drama because they were basically saying to the optic guys like you should have been here at this meeting because you know we're trying to get our point across to the cdl try and get them to listen to what we have to say and um skump kind of recently opened up that he was pretty frustrated with that perception from the pros that okay you know skump our biggest name player he should be there right to try and get our point across to the cdl of what we want to do for the season um but like skump you know said a couple of days ago like doesn't matter what i say it doesn't make any difference to what they try and do so um you know i guess i kind of see both sides of it in a way line but um it's um it's just Uh, an interesting one yeah but he shouldn't even have to be there like the fact that they're trying to convince the people that should be on their side anyway is ridiculous um it should just be like the easiest conversation ever get the issues out of the way and then it's all fixed. But yeah, regardless if he's there or not, does it make a difference? No. Hmm. 
I mean, I, like, so like teams and leagues and like everyone involved has, has meetings like, all the time. But uh, from like what I know is like you don't want like there's mandatory and then there's like ones where you just need representatives. And I guess maybe that was like one where they just needed a representative. But like I, I see like both sides of it. Like I do see where players would want the biggest player in the league that they think has the most pull in every meeting because they think like that's how they could get a lot of like lot out of the meeting. So, like I understand that point of view, but I also understand like like from Seth, like he said like I already had Ender and and, and Ray in the call. So like I don't like I've been doing this for years. Nothing ever like he felt like nothing ever changes. That's why he delegates or not delegates. He just he, like those are the other two that go in, not him. But you know, it did it did seem kind of pointless to be arguing on Twitter about being late to uh to a practice that you know that you know there's a meeting going on. Like it seems like a simple this DM would have you know cleared that up. But of course, it wouldn't be the COD scene if there wasn't drama on Twitter over something that could be fixed in a DM. So one times <laughs> we love it, Austin. We know how it goes. But uh, I mean, yeah, exactly. I don't understand why this had to be such a big deal, frankly. But um, still, a weird one. It would be. I mean, I know like Slasher came out of that meeting basically saying like, tried our best to make them listen, but uh, you know what we said didn't really get listened to. And we'll talk about the um, the confirmed format, at least what the CDL have said they're going to do for the season here in a couple of seconds. Before we get into that, I wanted to talk about something which is um. Well, a bit of a positive, well, I guess it's, a, it's positive more than a negative, is that the Boston team is a thing, right? We have a 12th team. Congratulations, everyone. It's going to be in Boston. We think it's going to be called the Boston Breach. That's, um, I'm pretty sure I saw a thing that the trademark has been filed for on the 16th of December by an organization called Oxygen LLC or whatever. So um, you'd imagine that's going to be the case. The team is going to be, we believe, Method, TJ Halley, Nero, and Capsidel. Very interesting team, very surprising team to a lot of people um there's a load of things to say really about this team like because of course method was going to be here no doubt there was some talk about okay is doug going to get a chance what's going to go on there they bring in zed and dens as their um kind of their well coach and general manager respectively and they've made the call as to they're picking up here so tj and i guess it's caps on the smgs new was the flex um and method just the main AR. like method just going to be here no brainer one of the best if not the best ar outside of the league biggest personality pretty much outside of the league with the exception of maybe sensor um him on the team no brainer rest of the team is very interesting right nero last year was on the lg academy he was apparently like um people say he was looking good on that team never really got a shot in the pro league though which is kind of surprising because they put mental into their starting team i think they maybe could have found a spot for nero um but cap's still in there as well like this is a player that I i'd heard of maybe not maybe middle of last year i start to hear about him but um not really for too long i think people are really surprised he's he's in here but in fairness so far in scrims austin they've been looking really solid i don't know how they've been faring up against you guys but um definitely obviously it's practice but you know they're looking pretty good yeah i mean so i was kind of shocked with the who they went with um you know i i like zinni like I, obviously when we were talking about building that roster you know zinni is is someone who's He's he's going to be like that sturdy like on the back end like on the back line he's going to be pretty you know stable back there he's going to do what he has to do he's going to do he's not going to you know do bad enough to hurt the team and, and chances of their win or loss so he's he, like I I like him as an AR he does the AR's job and he does it really well and he allows people to build off of that um, TJ like obviously when TJ is fully engaged in a team and he's like and he's he really likes the way the game is playing. He's amazing. Like you saw that at the beginning of Black Ops Four, uh, Jetpacks. He was like he was one of my favorite players in, in AW. Um, you know when he was on Stunner. Uh, it's just whether he's going to be engaged for the whole season. Like, is he going to be clicking? Does he like the game? You know, those are those are questions that you know people are going to ask throughout the year. Uh, I was kind of surprised they went with Neuro and Cap. Um, I like I, I knew like. The smart thing to do if you're going to be building a team is is go with probably two older and two younger guys, because when you're coming in this late into the free agency, your your objective is probably going to be get take two risks and then take two stable players and then try to either be aggressive in the um, free agency signings in between the the stages or um, you know build for the future and, and decide that way. So 
I do like that they went that way. I, I was a little bit surprised. You know, Capsule, um, a lot of people forget he was a part of the four stack that got caught cheating against Optic. Like, obviously, it wasn't him. It was, um, was it Bodied or, or Shiva? Shiva, right? Sh sh Shiv, yeah, something Shiv. like that. <laughs> so that's how I, like, I, I remembered him from that. But I also remembered, so in Cold, he, he played a lot in uh, Black Ops 4 with Shotzi. Mm -hmm. Um, when Shotzi was getting doing like um, uh, like tournaments and wagers and stuff like that, but in Cold War, I I wasn't that like he wasn't like a shining light in the AM scene that you would have picked to come next up, in my opinion. I, I but he also teamed with a lot of good players, which means that those players saw a lot of him. Like he was on a the Kaiser Mohawk Yuli Cap squad at the beginning of the game. He he actually teamed with Dens um, at one point. Uh, for a while, I think it was um, that was the Aches Dens Littlefoot Cap um, roster during. I remember That's... they were scrimming for a while, and then you know, so he he hasn't been on. He's been on rosters with you know Havoc, uh, Nagafin, Fire, um, Tish, who is the you know the Dallas sub. So mm -hmm. he does have a, a lot there. That, that I mean, maybe he's he's a grinder. So I, I think maybe he might he might have a good year. Um, Nero. I hope he does well. I, I do. It, so basically, all these guys like they like it's a risk, and it's a risk they're going to take, and then see how it goes for the start of the year. You know. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on because the fact that they're they're looking good in scrims, but the takeaway from scrims is pretty minimal because right now all they're scrimming is what eight maps, and they're only hard, hard point. point, and they're yeah, but they're only four hard point maps, and they just play each side, and that's a that's a set. And so, and also, what squad spawns is back. Um, oh, baby, oh, baby. Yeah, and I've heard that the way the game is played right now, if what I've seen is unusual, and so kill whoring is like really beneficial. Um, and so I don't really know what to take away from these early scrims, but um, it is promising that even though um, there was like not much expectation for this Boston roster coming in. The fact that it's a new year and they're looking solid so far is actually like quite good because it would have been annoying to have another twelfth team that was a top twelve team, you know. So it's it's likely that you know where they might be in that top eight, top six range by the looks of things so far. But I don't really have much to add on on Nero or Capital. Um, yeah, because I haven't really watched much challenges last year. So uh, it's a fair it's point. Fair they, point. Go on, they they go on. could be. They could be really good. That's the thing is at least they're taking risks and at least they're they're competitive. Like they're really competitive right now, which is something like you can't really say about, you know, a lot of teams that come in like last second. So they're competitive. They they have like good management. Like Denz and Zed are gonna be really strong. They have good backing. They have they have a lot of things. So as long as they're like active in, in roster management throughout the season, they like they're gonna be a good organization this year. One of my questions to you guys real quick on this roster is kind of the TJ question, because I think a lot of people would say, damn, TJ has been blessed again. This guy's back in the league. Like, I mean, I think it's probably a point that a lot of people would bring up because he, he's been in a similar boat, really, ever since practically World War Two, when he was the best sub in the game outside of Kenny um, and arguably at times the most impactful sub in the game. I think, as you say, Austin, I think you make probably and, you know, Crim6 has certainly talked about his criticisms about TJ as of late as well, about, you know, he, he coasts along. He doesn't really care too much about winning and losing. He's here for the paycheck, this type of stuff. Um, now, it's interesting, right? Because TJ, I think some people said like he, you know, doesn't deserve a shot back in the league. But of course, guys like John, right, who had a pretty tough finish to last year, he's back on Paris, and there's other players in a similar boat. I'm not surprised at all to see TJ back here. It makes honestly perfect sense um, in terms of an SMG to pick up. There's not too many SMGs that have the ceiling that TJ has, and so far in this game it seems to be very good. But um, it is an interesting one on the methods front, right? Because we know that methods thinks very highly of TJ. Um, thinks he's a very good teammate. So it's kind of like, you know, is this kind of a, is, do you think this is a decision Boston have made to kind of, you know, say to Methods, look, we'll let, we'll let you have TJ or whatever, and, and that's how we're going to build the team? Or like, um, it's interesting because you got to think if you're Zed and Dens, you always got to think, all right, if we're going to make a change, what's it going to be? And, um, you know, TJ was on LA Thieves last year to, um, well, you know, decent success, I guess, but then things didn't work out. So I don't know. It was a strange one, but, um, Still, TJ, it's 
probably the biggest, maybe the biggest, well, not really the biggest question mark, given there's Nero and Capsule there. But uh, it's kind of just one of these where he's one of these players again. It's like, if things go poorly, it could be his last year. You know, that's kind of how it feels. I know what you think, Austin. You've had your back and forth. Like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it, it, it's a risk. Like, uh, when you come in and you're so close to the season, you basically had, like, no free agency time, like, with the major players. The best bet you could take is, is is to do some risks and then see. Oh, mine. Oh, there he is. He's uh, back. Take some risks and basically to see like what pans out. Like for them to be good, like good for the entire season. Like obviously, probably all because like they did take three risks. I think Zinni's pretty like stable. He's proven. Like they did take three risks, and it, you know if two or three of them pan out, they'll they'll be set, or they'll have to make like one roster move to keep like being competitive. So if they're continuously active then they'll be fine but um you know tj at his best like when you think about tj at his best like that was probably remember when the la thieves what were they were like second or third for a stage last year they were like really competitive start I think of the like season Peraza. they were like yeah well i don't know you mean like when they were um they made their change and they beat optic or whatever yeah like stage yeah before the hook thing stage two maybe yeah so they, they were they were competitive and tj was looking good so like that's TJ at his best, and like TJ with with Optic at Vegas. If you get that, you're gonna get a really good TJ. If you get like the best out of Neuro, if you get the best out of Capital, like you could compete for ma for doing well at these majors. So that that's that's I think that's where they're they're trying to align themselves with. See if they can get the most out of some of these guys, and if not, be active during the year. I don't have anything to add on that. That's a fair point, boys. Good work, everyone. Um, okay, CDL format. Let's crack on. So, we heard rumors about this, and then it got confirmed by the league. So, first of all, the league confirmed that control is going to be the third mode. So, we'll see on that front, really? right? Uh, it is bit, the league did say it, um, that it's oh. going to be half one SD control. Thank but, goodness. you know, I mean, we'll see about that one. Because right it's now, it's, it's not in the game, you know. No, it's in the game, but oh, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's not playable competitively well, i don't know if you want to talk about well, this Austin, because maybe you've tried to scrim it the last few days well that's the thing is i i from what i'm hearing no one scrimmed it so there's just no one really knows how bad control is it, it's some it's one of those things where it's not great but um what are our other options so i, I feel like we hopefully we we get a small update on on some of the spawns with control and then it's then it will be better but i don't know if it's un, un as unplayable as as, as it is maybe maybe it is really bad some teams had really really bad ones but i haven't heard that it's as unplayable as as said from before can you just touch on some of the some of the issues because we've heard like three key things i think first of all squad spawns and control just doesn't really seem to work second of all things come up on your screen when you're trying to capture the points you can't shoot anyone or you can't see to shoot them and the other one is that the ticks don't seem to work all the time and if you get a tick it can just get reversed so what's the point so those are kind of the three main things that have that have been discussed as to why it doesn't really work right now but <laughs> yeah so like the glitch where where you have something pop up on your screen that does happen occasionally it's like one of those annoying glitches that happens but it doesn't happen like all the time the tick capture like that will that will have to be patched if that if that gets patched then the game would probably be fine the thing with the squad spawns is like there was like one bad clip where the spawns flipped somehow but i haven't seen like has anyone seen that since that one clip came out one of, yeah that, that was the berlin one i saw but that's how that i anyway. haven't seen it anywhere else um and maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe there is a lot of them and it's just completely unplayable but I have only seen that one. But um, I mean, if you think about it, squad spawns are probably fine in control because if you're spawning, as long as you're not spawning in the middle of the map, as long as you're spawning with your teammates on, on at your base, that I mean, it's fine. Like if you think about it, yeah. like last year, like a lot, like it, it squad spawns are really bad for hard point. I just don't know how bad for control. I mean, like, teams have to start scrimming it hard and seeing like truly how bad it is because that's how you learn. Like of all the glitches and how bad it really is, but we really haven't seen a lot of that. Like, um, out of all the teams that are scrimming, like streaming their scrims, you don't see them ever do control. And like, I don't know if that's because they played it a lot two weeks ago and they just decided like this sport is not going to play it. Um, but no one really plays it, and I don't know. <laughs> like, it could be, it could be like truly unplayable, just broken, not worth your time, or it could just be like one, one or two fixes away from being better than domination 
<laughs> oh god. Yeah, but the problem oh. is like how long is it gonna take for those changes to get made? And like will they be fixed in time for the kickoff classic, which is what in two weeks? I mean so, I mean they were just on vacation. Like yeah, I get not, that. this isn't an excuse. So like they are back, so if, if things are in, in the works, like hopefully, you know, it's within the next week or two. Um, because again, teams just haven't been scrimming control, so like even if it's even if control is in the game for kickoff, like it's not going to be good looking control because no one's really played it. So it's not going to be as like, oh, it's not going to be as good looking as like the end of Cold War. Like teams had so many had so much strategy and and team play in control by the end of the year, but at the beginning of the year it was a big clusterfuck and no one was good at attack. So that's yeah, it's interesting. It's very interesting. It's going to be chaos to a degree. Pick your poison. Pretty much, yeah. So the other question's been like, okay, well, we'll talk about the third game mode here actually in a second. First of all, we'll just discuss the format, um, like another potential third game mode, that being. So I don't know what's going on here. They've decided that we're not doing 12 ma team majors. The only event, at least as it is confirmed right now, I don't know if they'll listen to the backlash on this, but um, the only team that's meant to be at 12 teams right now is the kickoff event in two weeks' time. 12 teams attend that. The other majors and champs, only eight teams are there. I don't know if you heard about this line, but, you know, I'll, you know, fantastic stuff. So, yeah, eight teams are there. The qualifiers, which, you know, I don't mind this in theory, as long as the qualifications for the majors actually make sense, because the problem is that just like last year, you play five games across three weeks, just like the home series. But this time, these are instead of just home series, these are qualification matches. And if you, you know, I guess if you become in the top eight of the teams or whatever, I'm sure there's going to be some crazy tiebreakers as well. Um, then you get top eight and you make it to the major. Congratulations thing is these matches are online right classic so not done in mlg columbus ohio studios like they used to be back in the day these are online games which i kind of get why that's the case but you know you're qualifying for a major on LAN, and you've got to play online matches and the second part is that these matches according to the article i don't know if they'll do this but according to the article they're going to determine every match for the entire season outside of of course the major brackets they can't predict but all of the pre-seeded matchups the qualifiers are going to be randomly seeded before the season begins that's what they said in the article so Apparently, if you're Paris, you might just get completely blessed and play the four worst teams outside of you, like, I guess, the five worst teams outside of you for that particular week and have a great chance to make it in. Or before the season even begins, you could have a look at your season and every single stage you're playing phase. I'm like, well, you know, best of luck, whoever that is. Um, so, look, whether they change this, I don't know. I don't see them being particularly responsive to feedback as yet. They don't seem to say anything. But um, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Austin, because... The 18 majors, like, the idea isn't terrible, right? Champs is a thing, and maybe it makes the qualification matches more meaningful if it's like, okay, is it going to qualify for the major? But just the fact that these are seemingly randomly seeded matches uh, with no indication for the previous seeding on what your next season's matches are going to be, which, of course, they were last year, and they're online, just makes me think this isn't a particularly good idea. And also, no one asked for this, right? No one asked for the majors to be 12, to put eight teams instead of 12. <laughs> Yeah, so like I think the the thought process around having only eight teams at each major is to have a punishment for doing bad. But if you're playing, because like that article was really really ambiguous about how the seeding matches were laid out. Like there, last year we had mm -hmm. groups, and you would play everyone in your group once, right? In a perfect world, what what it honestly should be is you play every team in the league once. You play eleven matches, eleven matches over a month, and then you play a, a major. I don't know why that isn't standard, but if it is five random matches, like in and, and it's it's really weird how you could do that. I, I don't really know how they like if you just did like it's your first that. match, like random ball, like you know. Um I don't like that having a punishment because you know the strength of schedule is gonna be different for everybody. It just uh you know it's hard to be too hard because I don't know any of the thought process around a lot of it. You know, obviously Team, like fans want every team at every major. We don't want what we had in MW where people were like, oh, you only won because X, Y, and Z team wasn't there, right? You don't want that. You want every team at a major. You want every team to have a chance to win. You want, you know, you want the best tournament possible. So, you know, 
hopefully hopefully i don't know if you guys remember you know modern warfare there was changes made i mm. hopefully something does or hopefully um you know the 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 way the, the qualification matches switch so so it's not as so it's it's actual it's a hard to qualify like you you play all 11 teams or something like it, there's stuff they can do to improve it that hopefully they they do and hopefully they are listening to feedback which they're usually pretty good on that side um, I initially thought that it was, I think we talked about this, um, eight teams because there were only 11 teams in the league at the time and they were mm-hmm. covering their bases because they weren't sure if there was going to be 12. But now the fact that there are 12 teams, I feel like they've done the eight because I agree they want to punish teams for not playing well in the group stage. But I also think it's to like mitigate risks with COVID as well, to have less people at these events so mm-hmm. that something doesn't go drastically wrong um for the players or the teams um but in reality no one asked for eight teams um actually it was the exact opposite everyone was crying about how there should always be 12 teams um and in reality there should actually be 16 teams but uh (laughs) no we have eight so uh, i think with modern warfare that was the biggest problem i think was online but the second biggest problem was that we couldn't count these majors for each teams um, as championships because they're not beating the best teams they're playing against. They might get gifted a good run and then play a decent team in the final and then win an event. Like Paris got to the final of an event that they really shouldn't have made in 2020. Um, mm-hmm. But it is what it is. Like beggars can't be choosers. So <laughs> eh. I feel you on that. Um, yeah, I think that's true, really. The whole eight team thing. I, I don't know. I just think they need to be clearer about how, like, how and why they're structuring it as they are. And maybe they were planning this eight team thing, thinking there could well be eleven teams, because, like, the twelfth team situation didn't really get confirmed until after this whole thing came out. So maybe they are thinking about that. And as you say, Austin, back in Modern Warfare, they were going to do the worst format in esports history where it was going to be like a rotation around the globe and you go there and play like one match that's just a league match there's no winner you leave the weekend with no champion it's like god so at least we're beyond that um and and hopefully you know people always say right that the cdl this is what a lot of the pros have said the cdl has good people that are listening and they're going to try and do the best with the resources they have so if they do you know let's see it right like if they've got the resources to do an 18 major, they should have the resources to do a 12 team major. But I get Lion's point right about the whole COVID thing. And it is going to be a very interesting topic this year because right now it's all over the world, all over the place, but it's clearly a very mild variant. So it's like when, you know, are the rules going to change at some point? Because obviously last year at Champs, the big question was, that, okay, well, if someone gets COVID, you know, they're out of the weekend, right? Maybe their whole team's out for the weekend. What does that mean? Um you know, I don't know when the rules are going to change on that front because the fact of the matter is it's going to be difficult to pull off an event with land with fans uh, without someone, some of the players getting it at some point or another. Um, but obviously, if it's not harmful to their health at all, as it pretty much seems to be right now, especially if they're vaccinated, then it's like, well, you know, what difference does it really make? So it's, uh, it's an interesting question. I think probably they'll figure it out eventually and maybe the eight team thing helps that to some degree but it doesn't mitigate all the risk but i think that's a discussion for another day frankly um third mode just wanted to go back to it because we talked on as you're kind of saying austin maybe control is still better than domination um but kind of doug was saying all right let's say control doesn't get fixed right because the devs have Look, the kickoff event doesn't mean all that much, but it's still an event in a couple of weeks' time. Maybe they don't get it fixed by the time. What they've been doing in the challenger scene is they've been playing three S and Ds, two hard points. Um, Doug even reckoned maybe you just play domination anyway. If control is completely broken, is the play? Like, I'm not doing dominate. Like, please no. If if control is completely broken, you know, three searches could have to be done. I don't want to see it done. I guess it means it has to go S and D hardpoint, S and D hardpoint, S and D, because doing two S and Ds back to back would be kind of weird. Um, ugh, seems feels really ugly not having hardpoint game one, but maybe that is the option. Like, there's a world in which that happens, right? I don't know. So they actually just announced um, that search and destroy will be used for game three, 
So for the um, Challengers Cup this next weekend. So okay. that would do hard point S and D S and D hard point S and D, which I don't really understand. First off, I don't really understand why they didn't do uh, pro points for the first two cups because we didn't have control ready. But then the third cup, we still have control ready, and they're just like pro points. So that, that's also a little bit confusing. But um, if you go by that, and that was gonna, if that's gonna be the um, format, um. You know, it, it's a little bit tough because there's only, like, three or four... There's, like, three good... Like, I say good. There's three, like, okay S&D maps. Um, and that is Berlin, Bocage, and Tuscan. And then there's, like, Castle, which is, like, okay. Demiask, which is, a, like, they're, they're, there's just no real good options to fill that out. So if you're going to be playing three S&Ds, you're just going to see Berlin, Bocage, Tuscan, and everything. It's, that's just what the S&Ds are going to be. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. It sounds really boring. If like three maps Every out of series entire is series. guaranteed. So, that's um, funny, actually. That's a good point. Yeah, so you got to look out for that. And then, uh, you know, there's only four hard points. So you, you have pretty good odds that almost every single series is going to have the same maps um, throughout a tournament, which um, uh, that, that doesn't sound too interesting. Um, but you know, <laughs> no, maybe there will be a couple maybe. maps that get come that get put in and that are that are better. Um, because COD actually does somewhat of a decent job of putting out DLC, DLC maps that work for competitive. If you look back at the last couple of years, so maybe Bad maybe. Point. Um, so but th that's like my concern. Uh, in no world uh, ever should we ever put Dom in uh, for a third game mode again. Please no. Um, like I'm trying to think of uh, like I guess like patrol is the only other mode that is in the game I think that would be even in Token contention bad, for. <laughs> yeah, kill <Token> no, <laughs> they I should mean, try it. Did I would take that over Dom. So yeah, I mean yeah, you just got you gotta you gotta fix control. If control is one or two patches away from being usable, you force control. Hmm. Um, if it's as unplayable as as a lot of these teams have been saying then fair play like it's out of the game right but a lot of the, there's there's been teams that just haven't been playing um due to like holidays and other things and there's teams that haven't been playing it so like maybe it's time like we really gotta see is control actually playable like how bad truly is it like are there maps that actually work for it so if if there's a patch for the for the tick sticking if there's a patch for that that bar popping up like what maps are you even going to be playing like no one no one even knows that right now so if we're able to know what maps we're going to be playing for control when it does get fixed, then boom, we can be ready for it to be played, you know, right as, right as, as soon as the patch gets fixed. So, I mean, you really only need the bar glitch to get fixed and you need the ticks to stay. If you get those two, then it's at least playable. So, um, hopefully. Yeah, no. So, um, Dom should never be even mentioned in competitive ever again because in Modern Warfare, that was the most boring shit I've ever seen. But I also wanted to touch on Doug. I love Doug. He's like the man. He's the nicest guy ever. He's a golden retriever if it was a human. But why can he not tweet something that's complete bullshit? I don't understand, man. He will tweet something. I don't know if it's for impressions or if it's just how he feels. But almost every time I scroll as fast as possible away from whatever he's written on Twitter because it's just fugaze. <laughs> Next he, topic. He really, he really believes a lot of it too. Are you sure? Like fair play to him. Yeah, he, I'm, he I'm 100% sure. Yeah, but the he, streaming, he believes what he's saying. The streaming thing that started like a row on Twitter about how if players stream, the game would be in a better place. Ooh. I'll say Man. this about Doug. It was Doug probably a gem of, the rare of like, people. you know, good idea. Yeah, that, that's the thing with Doug. Doug actually loves this fucking game. Like he loves it. He lives for it. Mm -hmm. Man has opportunities to do so much other stuff, but he continues playing Call of Duty. I don't know why, but, but he keeps grinding away. And like, every, I feel like almost everything he tweets out, there's like a there's like a nugget of like a great idea in there, and then like a lot of Doug's personality surrounding it. So you kind of got to like chip away to find it. But like, he, what he's saying about making content. Like, 
it's true like everyone has to make content mm -hmm. but it's also like the league the league's youtube channel is embarrassing we really don't have any shows getting produced out of them we don't get any content produced out of them and like right now their content is barren and the league starts in three weeks like yeah i mean obviously i don't do the best job making content i have not been doing that either so like that's on us to also be making content that's on teams like i can count on like two fingers teams that that do content very very well in the cdl like there's a lot of players that i don't know i don't even know about like personally like i want to i want to know more about these guys fans want to know more about these guys so like his his nugget there was like content needs to be more of a focus within everybody but he coded it with players so yeah. everyone's just like oh, it has to be the players that has to stream scrims and do this and X, Y, and Z when why yeah. do every team not have a podcast? Why is there not a podcast with the casters? Why is there not weekly interviews on the CDL channel? Why is there there's a gazillion things people could be making and it's just not yeah. happening. Like the thing with the league is that it's always, always fallen on the players. All the responsibility, all the, the highlights, all the big moments, the storylines, everything has come from the players. And it's like to put more pressure on the players, even more than ever, when it should be the least amount of pressure on the players, it should be all on the developers, is just, it's just completely unfair and it doesn't make sense. Because for the longest time, COD has gotten away with a lot of bullshit because the personalities within the scene are so good and like polarizing to watch and they have great personalities and that's allowed the viewership to stay at like a good level. But in reality, if there was none of that from the players, if the players were boring, if we didn't have Scump, Formal, all those like iconic players, they would average 8,000 viewers for a major. It would like, be tough. Yeah. So I don't... Putting all this pressure on the players is just ridiculous because it shouldn't be that way anymore. I agree. I agree. I mean, it, we should be at the point now where this is what frustrates me kind of about the CDL really is that I said this in a video the other day. It was like, okay, when the CDL came in, I was very skeptical, but having kind of seen how it's gone, theoretically, there were some negatives and there were some positives, right? Okay, we're going to lose the open format, right? We're going to lose these open events. We're going to lose these cracking tourneys with all the teams there and, you know, Bravo, Charlie, Delta Station, everything around that, like Call of Duty's grassroots. We're going to lose that, okay? But we move in the direction of a more proper franchised ecosystem. The teams are going to get supported. The game is going to have some you know competitive integrity league players going to come at launch there's going to be team skins the organizations and the players are going to get supported more the league is going to be official activision have reason to care where they didn't really have to in the cwl days like you know it's going to be a trade-off right We're okay okay let's become a real sport type thing and go in this direction now the problem is so far at least we managed to get the worst of both worlds um which is kind of impressive but i still have some confidence that that kind of vision can be achieved at some point but you know, I think on the Doug thing, it's kind of funny because you're right. Like he, there's always a nugget of truth in there, but some of the stuff he says is outrageous, and it's it's definitely deliberate to a degree. Like Doug knows mm. how to create impressions, and if he has right. to do that by riling up a player by saying something against them, then you know that's just how it's going to go, right? Like he, he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, Very smart that way. Genius. Which I genius. respect. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's a, he's a marketing savant, like some would say. Really. Um, like no, he, he for sure knows what he's doing um and it is impressive and you know in fairness he he makes some reasonable points at times i think the the one on streaming is kind of it's it's just frustrating right because the players it's like the players shouldn't have to the responsibility should be on the players right it's not any other esport that's the responsibility of the players it's the but problem. it always has been in cards and you know they're not getting much help right from other sources i think you're exactly right austin like you know why why isn't the CDL interviewing even like some of the rookies or some of like, you know, Envoy would be a great guy to interview going into a new team. Obviously, 100 Thieves did that recently on the Courage and Nature show. But there's so many players I'd love to hear their perspectives. And I'm sure yeah, there'd be some good content for videos in there to talk about. But yet the CDL's YouTube channel is radio silence for the entire last two, three months. It's like, well, you know, give us something. Yeah, maybe they have six, six videos. <laughs> they have six videos in the last two months. And four of them are under four minutes long. Nice. Or five minutes long. Like, we're hard carrying, man. I'm telling you, we are hard carrying. I, I think Zuma. They, <laughs> they try things and then they don't get a lot of views. And so they just abandon it. Whereas they should be building the content towards where it could be, as opposed to trying to do like a flash in the pan, get the views and then get out. Like, that's not how it should be. You should build it towards where it could be. 
and they just don't do that. Consistency is so key, though. I don't. We can't really say much. We haven't done this podcast in a few consistency. weeks. Consistency. I know. You know. Like, uh, back- everyone, like everyone, has a role to play, and everyone can improve. Like no one is. There's like, there's like you on your personal channel are fucking killing it. Yeah. Zuma killing it. Vinny and 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 Seth streaming scrims killing it. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. I, I know there's a bunch of players that do in YouTube content too, and like social media content. Like Ryan, you've been doing cards. Like, but like almost everybody in the scene can do a better job of making content. That's that was like where I think Doug was going with it. Um, I hope. So like, yeah. I, I just think everyone's so in the like doom and gloom of how bad this game is. When like you can still make, I mean, there's still other ways to do it. Like you can do vlogs. People just want to get to know you. Like even if the game is shit. People still want, like, I don't know who Capsule is. I don't know his story. I don't, like, you remember when Hex had, uh, like, Alec on the, his podcast, or he'll have, like, Clay on his podcast. I learned so much about them personally. Like, where is that for everybody? Like, everybody else should be doing that as well. So I just hope, um, I hope we get some more creative, like, content series coming out of teams, and especially the league. I, I think they maybe are just like taking it off right now until the league starts back up because they are pretty active during the season. But it's like this is a very important time where you should have been helping. And it's, I don't know. It might just be that, like, similar to Maven and Merck, they just, you know, the content guys, they're just on a contract for like the season. And then to save money, they just don't decide it for the off season. It's like, well, okay, great. We have no content. So that's fantastic. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I agree. I just wish I wish there was something more coming out from that side because there's a lot of really interesting storylines that the league has the ability to do. I just think there's so many people and players also, and I know that Methods talked about this because he came back to YouTube and did like one video that didn't perform how he wanted it to and then he like kind of gave up, whatever. Um, and, it, you know, in a sense, it's good that Methods is kind of focusing on his Twitch and that. It's good to have a focus. But so many people and as you say, Lion, maybe CDL's guilty of this as well. They come along, they do like a few videos, they don't perform very well, and then it's like, okay, well, let's just scrap that one. But it's like, it's not about that, right? You need to be consistent to build up the YouTube algorithm likes it and to actually get people involved. Like when I started this Valorant channel recently in October, the first 20, 25 videos got maybe 50, 100 views, right? Like, you know, I'll just maybe 10 views on the first couple and then it started to pick up a bit and then give it two months and the videos are getting 10k a video and i reckon one day they'll get like five times that easy um so it's like you know come on man take some lessons when, when is the best time <laughs> to grow in the cod scene in the off season when no one else is doing content everyone's bored and just wants the league to be back that is when you grind your hardest and that's when like you get the highest reward like the league should have been really pumping out content. I mean, we've we've had our best month on YouTube ever this past month. Like shout out Omar and Dabs. Like we had the best month we've ever had. So like, I I just feel like there was a lot of opportunities missed. Even when the game is not very good on a playable side, it's like you can't really do like the hundred to zeros. You can't do pub stuff. But there's still other things you guys like that many people can do. So. I feel like it's on everyone's shoulders to work together and do a better job in the future about that. I agree. It's just, you know, some of the negativity, it can can bring people down, you know. Speaking of negativity, I'll throw another one in. New map coming to Vanguard, baby. I don't know if this is happening or not. I don't know if you saw this, Austin. But uh, there was a rumor that there's a new map coming and in the game files, and they might be bringing back... The fan favorite map from World War II, USS Texas, baby. They could have done Docs. They could have done Samory Dumont, but it's USS Tech Dalla. I don't know if this is actually happening, but apparently the game files say it's happening. Um, but as you talked about earlier, Austin, we need another search and destroy map. USS Texas, what a map that was. My, this is the, my hate, most hated map in God history, no doubt. It might be a hot take, but uh, yeah, I hate, I hate it like, Nah, I hate it. Good stuff, Canada, pub map, I don't care. USS Texas for competitive made me want to kill myself more than any other map ever. And I still put myself through it in, in GBs. But um, yeah, I don't know what they're thinking there. But still, if snipers are allowed, could be a fun time. Honestly, USS Texas in that game was 
like so frustrating compared to the other maps they're actually quite good um in this game it might be a breath of fresh air who knows so still if they do bring it back they'll probably ruin it with doors um but but anyway there might be there might be another map coming soon I, i'm just so surprised if it is texas like why why not bring back they talked about docks before the game was even out there was a leak that london docks was going to be making a return um sam Marie as well i yeah i think that'd be fantastic i, I love that map for hardpoint um one of my favorites ever so yeah i don't know don't know what you think austin like if there's one map you wanted to bring back in this game that's probably going to be a sledgehammer map you would think um doesn't have to be necessarily but might well be then you know why not bring back a london docks right you know why, why give us this <laughs> um maybe maybe they improved it and it's it's better maybe um maybe it's a little bit I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it because, like, I like me remembering the map. I'm trying to think of where doors and walls are gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, true. And it's kind of tough. Like, like I guess like the stairways that go up on each side, like have a door on the top of that. Mm. Um, other than that, I mean, I bet you the whole inner side of it is because it's gonna be a mess with walls and doors. But um, it could it could work for S and D. I I would rather I could I could take that over over. Demi Oscar, whatever, however the hell you say it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that that's one of our S S and D maps right there. Like, obviously, it doesn't have to, like a, a map doesn't have to work for all three modes, but you know, if it does, it does. So if it works for S and D. Like, I'll take it. Obviously, there are a a pretty small list of of really great competitive sledgehammer maps that work for boots on the ground in the past. So, like, I do hope. Um, you know, in the, ne <laughs> in the next couple months, we do get most of those in, um, which is pretty sad that every Call of Duty, we have to wait for rem remastered maps to fill out a competitive map pool. But, um, you know, I guess this is how it is. I, I do hope that we end up with five really great maps for every mode, like obviously control three or four. Like, what, I just want good maps for every mode. So it's going to take some work. I feel like um, Atlas would play really well. Oh, sorry, Detroit. 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 Yeah, because it's the one map in AW that really doesn't have many, like, jump-up spots. Could do Solar, too. Well, Valkyrie you know, was the remake, oh, wasn't it? Solar. Detroit flipped. Yeah, so. but they Solar's... Oh, they did use it. Yeah. No, Valkyrie came in, yeah. We could bring my Valkyrie. I'd be down, though. That was class. Yeah, Basically Valkyrie. Detroit, as you say. Um... I think um, solar wouldn't really work very well because there's so many areas where jump ups are important and you'd need ladders for those spots and I don't think that's viable. Um, but if you can a think log about ladder after any, top three. yeah, if you can think about any well, AW, if they just took that out. Which ones do you think from AW other than Detroit would work well for boots on the ground? Fringe. Oh, that's I got Fringe Black Ops Three. I mean, Biolab was always one of my favorites. I think Biolab could work, maybe. Or mm -hmm. just make a good original that that is catered to a specific mode that works. You think they're gonna do that? I wish. That's um, less I mean, likely that's... than bringing in BioLab. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I. I BioLab Detroit was really the only one that could properly work. Yeah, BioLab has those like, um, those like bridge things above, like around the outside that have those explosive barrels. Yeah. So I don't think that well, would nah, you make that work. There's a lot of platforms also, in it, really. It would be tough to I also wish they would tweak some of the maps. Like, I feel like there are some maps that have decent, like, bones to it. You know what I mean? Where, like, if they change things about it, maybe it would work. Like, that's something I feel like that we'd hmm. never really get in Call of Duty. Like, in CS, a lot of the times, they, they'll switch, they'll change how the map is. They'll change, like, cobble, Cobblestone was changed so many times. Hmm. And they'll change like little things about it to make it work for competitive. Um, obviously, <laughs> there's not a ton of options in in the in the pool, but sometimes I do wish that they would uh, be able to tweak these maps and change it to work better for other modes. You know, I, I agree, but I feel like CS:GO had that because the game is now at this point ten years old. And that's really all they needed to adjust was the maps. Whereas COD's got all these different things going with different departments working on different areas and tweaking a map for control is like the least likely thing they'll do. And they did just... do it though from the beta in Black Ops 4. I don't know if you guys remember this, but in Black Ops 4, um, 
it was Seaside, and I'm pretty sure it was our very own Dabs that made a thing about, you know, like the outskirts bit on P1, would it have been? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's P1, in yeah. Lower. Yeah, in lower, yeah. That outskirts thing didn't exist in the beta, it wasn't even there. And Dabs made a diagram saying that they should add this outskirts area to that part and like put it on Reddit and the developers saw it and they made the change when the time the game came out. Now, and that actually made the map a lot better to be honest, because otherwise it was just one door to come in through and you couldn't go around the left side there. Um, so they did do it, but of course that's Treyarch, right? Um, yeah. And it's also from beta to real game. By the time the game actually comes into effect, then, you know, they have other priorities, but I kind of agree that the map, you know, map tweaks would be so huge. Um, like Oasis and Eagle's Nest, like, they don't work. But, like, they could if you change some things about it, you know? If you ch if you worked with the spawns, if you worked with what the map gives you, like... Eagle's Nest feels like... like it should work, but I guess with some tweaks, you know? Yeah, I feel like that's more likely to get to ch get changed than for them to come up with a whole new map that works for competitive. I, I don't know. That's just me. But we don't really get too much of that. Mm, I don't know. I feel like them creating new maps also helps with marketing, and so they're more inclined to create a new oh, map. Yeah, hundred percent. Oh yeah. So I feel like I don't know about that. Hmm. Uh, it's tough. Ah oh, well, you know, it's okay. We can stay positive. Um, final thing, just before we close out the episode, been going an hour, about an hour here. CDL kickoff, right? Coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Um, you know, just wanted to talk real quick about the format because the format was kind of leaked. I don't know if it was officially announced. Well, they, they kind of did say it, to be fair, what it was going to be. But um, I think they leaked it kind of when they were announcing the tickets. They hadn't really done a formal announcement, but they kind of explained it when they did the ticket reveal type thing. Um, so anyway, it's basically a single elimination event. All 12 teams go, and I think the top eight teams start wherever, and then, or maybe the top, I forget exactly how they're doing it. It might be like top six teams, then there's like... The bottom four have to face off against each other or something. They haven't really announced how the seeding works yet, but it's single limb, I guess. Maybe, no, I think it's the top four teams have buys, and then the bottom eight teams start in winners round one, and the top four have buys. I think it will be on the seeding from last year, you would presume. Um, and I guess because Optic and Dallas were both top four, they're now one spot. So I guess it shifts up and New York become fourth. So whatever. Um, However that goes, it's single limb. People are frustrated about the fact that it's single limb, which I get. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on this. First of all, it'd be better if it was double limb, obviously. But at the end of the day, this event is meaningless. There's no money on the line. Uh, there's no points on the line. There's no money? Oh, there might be money, actually. I don't know. They didn't... I don't remember I don't seeing know if they've up. said. There might be money. Um, but hopefully there's money. But regardless of what happens... It's kind of like, look, I think this, ideally, this event should matter, right? There should be something on the line at this part in the season. But because there's not, I don't mind the fact that it's single limb. I'm just happy that there's a champion. Because the last two years we've had kickoffs, there wasn't a champion. Minnesota launch weekend in 2020, it was just each team plays two matches and then you go home. Last year, it was pretty sure the same story. Um, this year, there's a proper event with a champion. So... You know, yes, it's single limb, but we get all 12 teams at a LAN in Texas. One team wins at the end of it, creates huge amount of storylines for the year. Um, so honestly, I'm happy about it. If there's money, great. If there's not, whatever. Um, there's no points for the year. I think that there should be some points, right? Like, I don't know, they should do something to give a team a head start if they win. I don't know. Um, but still, it's better than it was last year. So I'm actually happy about that. Don't know what you think, Austin. Yeah, this should have been like what they did in like December. Uh, they should have had yeah, one exactly. in like they should have had one at the beginning of December, one in January. Had, you, know, you can just how the NFL is multiple preseason games. You can if you don't want to start the season, you still have multiple preseason tournaments. You know, uh, like I am happy that this is definitely a huge step up from what we had last year. I think everyone can agree that having two random games that that, that are supposed to be preseason that awards you points. And it's it's two yeah. fixed matchups that the CL did. That, that <laughs> should fixed. not have been a thing. Um, so like this is a huge improvement. That's like you can give them credit. Huge improvement. All twelve teams are there. Huge improvement. There's they're all starting in the winners bracket. That's a huge improvement. Single limb. I get it. I I do just because isn't it? It's only like two days, right? I think it's three days. It's three days. Uh, still quite a lot of matches. Yeah. 
And like this is basically going to be a warm up for the CDL production going into the new year. Like I, I do understand where that is. They want to try some stuff out, be able to come back for the mate for like the when the major starts or like the actual season starts and, and do that. So I, I do get it. Preseason tournament, it doesn't have to be double limb, double limb, but everyone would like that. Um, if there's no money, like whatever, I'm just happy there's a tournament that people can play and it will still be taken seriously. It's a, it's a great to get back into the the vibe of being in a tournament, being a, it, 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 and it's at land. So yeah, being at land. So it, like it's it's pretty it's pretty awesome, honestly. I, I take this over over what we had last year, and hopefully they take the criticism. I think that because I don't know, I feel like there has been some criticism towards it. I just hope they just continuously make the preseason events better and better as they go. I mean, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um... But you mentioned it should be earlier. I think maybe they should have at least two before the season starts. Um, and I did just look. I don't think there is a prize pool. Nothing's been announced. But it would be pretty cool if us at Breaking Point put up like 4K for the winner or something. Like, <laughs> be like, you know, we could do that yeah, for sure. We could do that. But, um, yeah, no, I lost um, a massive check. It's like twenty uh, quid, but it's a massive check. It's be pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I'm just excited to see some form of competitive COD because it's been so long. Um, it's been what since August. So end of uh, August, yeah, yeah. It's been uh, tough. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just excited to see some COD, and I think that's what they were going for by uh, making it take so long. But the fact that the season is still going to only be seven, six months long is, I don't know. Just not how it should be, but should anyway, be minimum two I'm weeks a... after the game launch, yeah, preseason, two weeks yeah. before the season starts, at least pre-season. even a month, like a month, but two and a half months before the league starts is just not it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I don't know to me, they if next year they do what they've got now, this preseason kickoff event, if they do that in mid December, like when Halo did the rally event. Like, that's a big improvement, even if it's not, like, right after the game launches, but even if it's just mid-December, like it used to be in the CWL days, and there's a kickoff event then, and then, like, in January, either the league starts on, like, the 5th of January, or there's another big event, right, something like that in January, and then the league starts in February. I don't mind, but I just, you, guys, you know, it needs to be something Black big Ops, in December. In Black Ops 3, it was, like, the week after Totino's Invitational. Yeah, that was crazy. Man, right? Like, because, yeah. I mean, I remember Formal had touched the game for about four hours, so he had a point seven, <laughs> but it was still exciting I'm to okay watch. with that, though. Yeah, like, it was yeah, really, yeah, like, just a, nice a bit of a prize pool, nice little, you know. See how it went. Everyone was using, like, uh, the lethal weapon specialists instead of the actual, like, tactical mm. ones. Like, a nine yeah, exactly. round 11 was really strange, but it was nice to, mm. like, see the game in that early state as well. Exactly, it's fun. It's the same thing in Infinite Warfare, right? When the right at the start of December, it was maybe the third to the fifth of December, they had the Vegas event, the Rise one, when uh, Facento was MVP with uh, Skinny Bar and the Osa, and it was like, okay, yeah, yeah, mad, you know, it's pretty. It used to be fun because anyone could win those early events, and it's like that would be perfect for these for this game because we know that the CODs take a while to get good, but. That's fine if you have a kick of event with some money and you know you don't have to give points. Maybe give the winner some points or something, but yeah. like just something to watch, right? And something to build storylines and see who yeah. is the best team because we don't know who's the best team. Like you know, we, we should have an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll say know. this: like league matches, like this is why league matches are important. This is why preseason events. You do not get very many options mid-season. So like, think about it. Last year, you had you had five stage matches, and then you had the major. You do not get many chances to practice your map pool in a live event, right? You don't. You don't get to take risks on a map that, that you're unsure of that maybe you want to take you want to see if you can grow on it. That is the best thing that came from Black Ops 4 is those like 20 league match mini seasons they had per month. You could just yeah. try out maps all the time. Like you didn't have to take every series as serious. Like you, you like you could still take it very serious, but you can do your vetoes differently. You don't have that now. That's why it's really, really, really hard to develop your map pool. Because even though you're good at something in a practice, like last year we were something crazy, like 92 and five in APOC at, at one point. But we were we were like two and four in league matches because we just didn't get a chance to practice that enough, right? And that's 
that was us saying that. And um, so, like, what they should be doing is having a lot of league matches at the beginning of the season, have preseason of matches at the beginning of the season, allow teams to develop their map pool, get their structure down, because that's literally what the beginning of the season is for, experimenting and getting your structure down. And then at the end of the season, you have more tournaments, less league matches. It's more just, like, straight up just, like, CDL Anaheim's just tournament. Like, you don't need the league matches at the end of the season. Like, that's where people check out because they don't want to watch us play LAG for the fifth time in the year over a me meaningless league match. They want to see tournaments where stuff's on the line. So, like, that's the one thing I hope they change. Preseason and league matches at the beginning of the year, tournaments only at the end of the year. Um, okay. Sounds good. Well, should we go to the viewer questions? Because I have a question. Um, Fire away from the viewer what, line, Matt. From both of you, I want to know, what was your favorite competitive game to watch? And also, what was your favorite format of the league since you started watching? So, both two questions. Okay. Austin, do you want to go first or should I go? You can go. Okay. Favorite game and favorite form of the league, right? Yeah, it's not game to play. It's game to watch competitive. Game to watch. Oh, I see. Okay. I think it has to be Black Ops 3 still. I don't think, especially since I started watching, I think it's tough to beat that. To watch competitively, um, yeah, I would watch... Black, Black Ops 3 is just a no-brainer because I could watch anything on that game. Like, the maps are so good. I'd watch Nick Merckx play S&D scrims or, like, um, S&D tourneys. I'd watch all the teams play scrims if they're streaming them. I'd watch the eights after they finished. That game was just so much fun on all fronts. I think that slightly underrated, actually, is Infinite Warfare. I know it came just after that, but I think that that game to watch was actually, especially Hardpoint towards the end, was actually really entertaining. I think that Infinite Warfare gets less credit than it deserves. Um, Search and Destroy was chaos and didn't play very well, obviously. You just four hit a bombsite. But, like, to watch it was actually really interesting. Like, you could see the minimap, one team, you know, all four play like all eight players are converging on a site. It's kind of funny. Um, okay, favorite format of the league? I think probably the World War II season, at least since I started watching, was very good because... I know that Infinite Warfare had kind of like, I think they had like a land league thing that was happening. I forget exactly what they did that year. Say again, Lion. Global Pro League, it was, what was it, two groups of six, and then they would play each other, and then they would go for the land league or the land mm. event. It was weird. Yeah, so it wasn't bad. I mean, Black Ops 3 would have been great with more lands. I was just missed. It was just too few lands, and I kind of liked the online stuff. It actually what really got me into it was watching the online league matches that were just streamed like all the time. Um, I think they got a lot of people into it because they were just live on YouTube all the time that I'd watch. Um, and so there was that. I mean, yeah, I think that season would have been a load of bear with a load of different lands. I think that since I've started watching, to be fair, Black Ops 4 was pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I might, I might be tempted to say World War II, actually, because there was a load of events. There was two events right at the start of the season. There was... Um, there was NOLA and there was Dallas. It was Dallas and then it was NOLA. Then it was Birmingham. Shout out that one. That was the first COD event I went to. First LAN event, actually, like, of anything. Um, the LAN League was good. I think if that game had been more interesting, that year would have been received a lot better because the actual way the league was structured, stage two, stage one, stage two, there was Seattle, Anaheim, like, LAN Pro League mixed in with actually a lot of major LAN events plus, like, a really interesting world championship I thought was... I thought it was done really well that year, to be honest. So, favorite to watch Black Ops 3, best year of um, format World War II. Yeah, so mine, my, mine go back a little farther. I think my, my favorite year to watch was probably Black Ops 2. And there's like a three way tie because I actually really liked Ghosts, which sounds weird because they had Blitz and they had Dom. But like, the S&D in that game was actually really amazing, even though they had a glitch Incredible. where you couldn't plant the bomb for a while. But um, Black Ops 2 and, and Black Ops. Uh, I watched a lot of Black Ops with, like, Quantic Leverage and the we Team love Black Fear. Ops, Mate, yeah, that was... I liked that one a lot. I'm 26. years ago. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. I, I still remember, uh, like, that was when Teep and Aches were, like, cream of the crop, and I, I really liked watching them. Um, that was probably the game I played the most. Uh, I had I had a lot of time on that one. So, uh, my favorite season. Um, so I really really like Black Ops Four. I think it was super underrated for like how they split that up. Uh, I do 
like uh World War Two's was good. Um you know, and then like I feel like the jetpacks never had like the perfect one. I feel like like IW was 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 okay. I feel like like um what was it? Black Ops Three needed more lands. I feel like AW was a little bit too clustered, but yeah. I did like how AW had a lot of different tournaments and structure. That's one thing I do miss in COD is like, why does every tournament have to be the same? Like, I get it from like the basic viewers, but sometimes I wish we could have different ones be a little bit more creative, um, with with structure. You know, like whether it's GSL, you know, there's competition uh, between the organizers as well to like one up yeah. each other, right? And that that I do miss that. I miss that a lot. Um, so I think I would have to go like AW was my favorite because there was just always big tournaments, but you burnt out a lot. And then like Black Ops Four, like I really liked that, but it was only sixteen. Whereas like if like four a amateur team, if it was like because they did the four groups of four. If if an amateur team could slide in and be the fifth for each one for each group, that would have been cool. But like I understand why they didn't. And then I probably World War Two is my third. I'll do those three. So what do you think, Ryan? Formats, or what was your favorite game? Was it Black Ops Two? I like I would do like Black Ops, Black Ops Two, and then like Ghost for S and D. Yeah. 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 Um. Well, I guess I'll answer as well. My favorite, like, to watch as the game was. Probably yeah, Black Ops Three because it's just for me that's my favorite COD, just is. Um, and then my favorite format, you mentioned it before, it's AW, just because that was the first year I was like truly obsessed with COD, like obsessed. And I would watch all the Optic guys on four different streams, and they would play what like eight league matches a week, something ridiculous mm -hmm. during yeah. the week. And on the weekends, they would have like the ten-hour tournaments on Saturday and Sunday two different ones and so there was just so much cod it was almost overexposure of the scene but for me i loved that so much because there was always something to watch if i was doing something like doing nothing and then the events that year like so there was the mlg ones there was the umg ones there was the gfinity ones there was what was that oh esw was the one in paris esw, ESW. Mm -hmm. and then there was they chance one in well. canada too yeah they had one in canada some random ones yeah like yeah. AGN or something. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then Champs was in March, which was actually I kind of liked that. Champs being in March, and then they had the they still had the league uh, playoffs during the year, and there were three different playoffs during the year, as well yeah, as X three games. like stages, right? That's yeah, except the last year of X games. Of that, yeah. so I just think for me, X games too. Yeah, yeah, that was the year. And um, I remember the first map I watched of AW was, well, the first moment I watched of AW was round 11 of MLG Columbus phase versus Optic, the fine, like of the end of the first series, because it was a two best of fives and it was the end of the first best of five. And I don't know, that's just, for me, that's peak, peak COD. Yeah, yeah. well, there we go. I think that's a good place to end it, frankly. Um, some nostalgia, some hope for the future. Um, and yeah, well, we'll we're still going to be here. I agree with what we said earlier. You know, Doug said to Martin, he's got us all rolled up and ready to attack the year. We're going to pump out the content, baby. Um, we've got some great ideas actually for videos coming over the next month or so before the league starts as well. Uh, Omar, Dabs, myself, going to be doing our best. Podcast is back in business. Once the season starts, I think hopefully a lot of the cobwebs will kind of be thrown to the to the wayside and uh, the storylines and the excitement of the season hopefully will uh, will take over again uh, we'll be here to break it all down for you guys thank you very much for watching long episode first one back hopefully you guys enjoyed it um, good to have the full crew back in business and we'll be live on twitch this time next week probably with some power rankings type stuff um, and uh, of course whatever else happens in the call of duty world thanks for watching as always take care of yourselves and we'll see you next time